Hello, Walmart here from Sweden. Hello everyone, a very warm welcome to everyone to this discussion tonight we're having on the future of conservative parties. Conservative parties have been the guarantee of human freedom and liberty, achieved unparalleled prosperity for societies by unleashing the potential of the individual based on market econ economy principles and free trade lifted hundreds of billions of people out of poverty and into dignity and jobs. Conservative parties have forged security alliances and kept us safe uh, between the United States and Europe. And um, conservative parties have stared down communism. It has created leaders such as Churchill, Reagan, and Thatcher and Konrad Adenauer. And even today, the United Kingdom is led by conservative leader Boris Johnson and Germany by Angela Merkel. And Norway is led by the second longest serving conservative leaders, leader, which is Arna Solberg. Yet, have conservative parties outlived their role can they tackle the pressing challenges of today? We see conservative parties going in very different directions. In order to shed light on these questions, we, have, we are very, very excited to have such a distinguished panel with us, with uh, conservative friends from uh, the United States, from the United Kingdom, from Germany and Sweden. And um, we will start this by uh, me challenging each of our, uh, of our panelists on some uh, pressing issues uh, that their parties are facing. And I will start off with our American friend, Congressman uh, Dusty Johnson. Uh, it's great to see you again uh, and welcome to the discussion. Thanks, Board. I really appreciate it. And, and I would just start by noting that I'm really honored uh, to have been asked to participate. I know you know this, Board, but uh, for everybody else, uh, my people come from Norway. My grandfather emigrated, and uh, we are still very much Norwegian Americans. Uh, the culture is important to me. It's, in, it's important to my sons. And so uh, getting invited back, uh, in essence, to the home country, uh, to talk about conservative values, which I love, it was an absolute joy. I would also tell you, I can't help but note the quality of the other panelists. I feel a little inferior to the task. Uh, you have pulled together uh, the absolute varsity team uh, of quality. And so uh, we're, we're voting today. It's, uh, it's midday here in America. Uh, and so we're voting and I'll need to dash off to votes, but I'm gonna stick around as long as I can to learn from people who are uh, wiser than I am. You know, board first wanted me to address the 2020 elections in America and whether or not it was a, uh, a failure, whether or not it was a setback for conservatism. And exactly, I think- Exactly, yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I, I think that, uh, I, and thank you so much for those words, uh, uh, Dustin Johnson. And 
exactly. I think uh, if you could start off with the 2020 election, if was it really uh, uh, such a, a failure for the Republican Party? But also what we are also very eager to hear is, is the Republican Party now the, the MAGA party or are they going back to the roots of uh, traditional conservatism that we know from Reagan and Bush? And, and, and thirdly, I would challenge you to, on the issue of, we saw the CPAC conference attacking very strongly culture wars and woke ideology. Is that what conservatism is about today or are we also uh, very uh, concerned with economic issues, the, the classical ones. So please, we're very eager to hear from you. We're so happy to have you all. Well, you can tell how eager I am. I wanted to do not just my job, but yours as well, <laughs> by, by diving right in. Uh, and, and clearly, November 2020 uh, was not a perfect day for American conservatism. Losing the, the Senate hurt a great deal. You never want to lose the presidency. But I think when you pull the lens back a little bit, there is some good news for conservatives as well. There was not a single Republican incumbent in the United States House that lost his or her seat. And that is almost unprecedented. Uh, you compare that to the fact that 15 Democratic incumbents lost their seats, and I think that's noteworthy. Perhaps what's even more noteworthy is that all 15 of those Democratic incumbents lost their seat to a Republican woman or a Republican person of color. Now, that's not in the standard media narrative about uh, the Republicans in America, uh, that we are, are, are diverse and just teeming with incredible female talent and, and talent uh, with uh, people of color, but, but that is really... But that is who led the charge uh, and the large pickup of seats uh, within the House for conservatives. And, uh, you know, if there is a silver lining about President Biden's election, it's that the president's party uh, in America loses on average 31 seats in the House in the midterms. And so I think much of Washington is operating under the assumption uh, that Republicans will be back in control of the House in uh, you know 20 months or so. And I think that is something to look forward to. It, it reminds conservatives that we need to continue to be focused on ideas because our exile might not last a decade. Uh, it may be a relatively short exile. And when given an opportunity by the American people to again, uh, speak to conservative values and govern with conservative ideology, we need to be ready. Uh, we cannot squander that opportunity. Uh, I would also note, because obviously Donald Trump is uh, a massive personality and one who not only you know, dominated American politics, which he did, but also cast a large shadow across the world stage. And, and his loss, I think, should not be seen as uh, a loss for conservatism. I mean, I think so many of the factors really dealt more with his particular brand and approach. One important data point I would offer board uh, everyone is that Republican candidates for the House received more than 4 million more votes than Donald Trump did. Mm. And there are almost 200, now there are uh, 212 Republicans in the U.S. House, uh, almost 200 of them received more votes in their districts than President Trump did. So I think that speaks to a hunger that the American voter has for conservative ideologies. Of course, we're not going to win every race, and that hurts my feelings and, and perhaps yours as well, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's worth noting. And so you asked about the future, Board, in your introductory comments. And I'm going to be honest, everybody, it is going to take a little while for the American Republicans to answer that question. And I think that creates a tremendous opportunity uh, for conservatives within Norway and elsewhere to help lead the way. Uh, you know, clearly the Republican Party in America needs to be about more than just one person. Uh, Donald Trump is a powerful leader with a powerful vision, but uh, the Republican Party in this country has always been a party of ideas and of principles. And I think that is uh, when we can speak with the loudest voice and have the greatest impact uh, on policy. And uh, conservatives ha have always learned so much from one another uh, across the Atlantic, uh, within uh, the, the NATO neighborhood. And, and I think this is an opportunity where, where we can look to so many of you to help us understand what do conservative policies look like uh, in the years to come. And, and I would point out one that, you know, of course, Norway and the United States, uh, proud NATO members. And, and I think uh, the American conservatives have had a more complicated relationship with NATO in the last couple of years. And I think uh, Norway, there's an opportunity 
uh, for you to talk about the incredible benefits to all free people of uh, the greatest multilateral uh, agreement and coalition in the history of humankind. And it is not perfect and it is frustrating like all things and all organizations. But I think the strong leadership uh, from Norway, uh, your strong voice will remind American conservatives why NATO has helped to, uh, in a very positive way, change uh, the trajectory of this, uh, of this world. Um, now, you, uh, you asked a little bit about, board about, you know, what, what, uh, what do we stand for and what should we stand for? And, and I feel like it's uh, the American Republican Party. Anytime you lose the presidency, you feel lost for a little while. And I think we need to get back to basics. And I don't know why y'all invited me because all I'm gonna do is repackage what Board said at the very outset, which is to talk about security arrangements, to talk about lifting people out of poverty, to talk about work. I mean, I think there is a tremendous acknowledgement within all of our peoples and, and our other panelists, you know, from Sweden and from Germany and from the UK will almost certainly mention it too, but work provides dignity. And it provides people an opportunity uh, out of poverty. And of course, all good people, regardless of their political affiliation, want economic opportunity and mobility to be a central part of the story of their nation. And to the extent that American Republicans, American conservatives carry that banner forward, I think we'll be even better positioned uh, you know, to, uh, to come back into power and, and to govern as a party of ideas. Uh, I, I'll mention uh, one more thing, maybe before segueing to your question on, on cancer culture board. I think American conservatism is strongest when it is optimistic. And you talked earlier um, uh, about, uh, uh, about Churchill and, uh, and about Thatcher and about Reagan and about other uh, great uh, conservative leaders throughout time. They were fundamentally optimistic people and uh, it is probably true that if you asked uh, the average Republican on the street whether they more respected uh, Trump uh, or Reagan, they would tell you Trump, but I'd tell you Reagan. And I think time will continue to fondly remember Ronald Reagan because he was a problem solver and because of his optimistic belief in the goodness of people and of uh, the American spirit and the spirit of all free people and of Western civilization to make the world safer and to lift more people in our countries as well as across the globe out of poverty. And I think that optimism is absolutely central to the conservative ideology. And so to the greatest extent possible, if we can set aside anger and embrace optimism and hope, I, I think we, we will make an even better world. And, and then finally, uh, with regard to cancel culture, there are ideas, there are ideologies within uh, all of our countries and within the far right uh, of uh, all of our countries that are ugly uh, and that are indefensible. And I simply will not waste any time defending the indefensible against criticism in the public square. But so many of my colleagues on the left are not just interested in uh, rejecting hate, which of course I, I'm interested in rejecting hate as well. But they fundamentally want to criticize and fundamentally want to marginalize ideas with even, uh, even within the mainstream of conservative thought. And I think this is a real challenge for all free people. We know that a country without memory, uh, or rather a country without its history is a country without its memory. And that means that we will be poorly positioned to tackle the challenges in the future. And of course, my country has made so many grievous errors so many things of which uh, you know, we have should have apologized for and have. Uh, we were governed by imperfect men and women, but they were still incredible leaders. And uh, we should not attempt to uh, eliminate or make invisible the impacts of these imperfect men and imperfect women, whether in politics or whether in art or whether in literature. We need to celebrate and raise up their strengths uh, rather than cast them aside or bury them because of their weaknesses. And I think if conservatives across the globe can come together to talk about that shared mission uh, for that and for other reasons, uh, I think the future of conservatism is incredibly strong. And thank you uh, for the opportunity. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dusty Johnson. So inspiring uh, and, uh, and, and honest and, and frank uh, uh, analysis. And uh, uh, thank you so much. And uh, I hope if we have time uh, to get uh, some comments from you on, on China, uh, but I will 
uh, move on for now to um, our friend from uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, I hope you're here, uh, Brendan Clark Smith. Welcome. Is, is Brendan. Good evening. How are you? Hi. How are you doing? Uh, very good. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me tonight. Well, thank you so much. You know, uh, it's. Uh, I, I'm so glad that that you were, were able that you wanted to join us because you have such an interesting background uh, coming into uh, being elected in December uh, 2019 in a district that has been labor for 90 years, if I'm correct. And uh, I think that with the biggest swing right from labor to conservative in the, in the whole election of districts. Um, it was that's that's correct yeah not not just this election uh it's the biggest labor to conservative swing ever in any election um that we've had nationally so it was quite a uh it was quite a nice surprise in the end yeah so about 18.4 uh it was so got one one of the bigger ones really so i think we had a good chance of winning but i don't think anyone quite expected us to to win by the margin we did so the the signs were very good and i think the last couple of weeks going towards the election we'd we definitely noticed a temperature change there. Yeah. Um, I think I should also say I've got some very strong links with Norway as well. Uh, I was a teacher in Norway. My, my son was born in Norway, uh, in Sarpsborg. Uh, so so this is this is equally great for me. And uh, I see we've got colleagues from Sweden as well later. And uh, I also uh, went to university there. So so yeah. I have a lot of a uh, lot of love for the Nordic uh, Nordic countries. Well, that's wonderful. But, um, but, but, um, yeah. Sorry. So yeah, and and of course, what we um, what we saw was the fall of the red wall, as it was called, uh, and these are the seats who were traditionally Labour held uh, for for a very long time, as you mentioned, and we we've pretty much renamed it the blue wall now. But this is very much integral uh, now to where we're actually winning more votes. We we have a a by election coming up very soon in. Uh, very prime red wall territory as we would say and this is pretty much what we'll probably be talking about tonight i suppose is how our uh, voter base has been shifting over that period exactly and and this is uh, and I, i'd like to make the the point wider and 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 have you uh, comment even wider with that knowledge you have of, of your district and and really uh, experiencing it because i think it's a, a shift that we see uh more blue color workers in the United States voting conservative. Uh, we also uh, see that in other European uh, countries that uh, kind of the working class is, um, is, is tending to vote more uh, conservative. Um, and I'm, I'm sure in your district, there's a number of reasons, but this general point, it would be really interesting if you could um, comment on that. Is, is the future of conservative parties to, to actually try to win over more working class people and why are they voting conservative now? I, I think so. I, th I think they have voted in, in the past for us, but uh, we, we almost reached that kind of junction in, in history. Um, and for, for us, that was Brexit um, quite clearly. But what, what we found is there were various reasons why we, we wouldn't necessarily get that blue collar vote before. And uh, Brexit was perhaps the event that, that spurred that on. But the, the signs have been there for a while, really. Um, one thing I would say is I think as conservatives, a lot of traditional working class blue collar um, voters, they, they have those conservative values. Um, in the UK, for example, they, they are uh, strongly passionate about things like the monarchy or our armed forces uh, or tough on law and order. And those are all things that you would strongly associate with with conservatives normally, but they they would historically and traditionally because their parents, their grandparents or the community were in, they, they would be more towards uh, the socialist parties or the Labour Party in our case. Um, and let's say Brexit really gave people that opportunity to give us a try. And what you'll have seen is Prime Minister Boris Johnson, he did refer a lot after the election to as being lent votes. Um, people were loaning us those votes and giving us that chance. Um, so for us, this is a really, really good opportunity for us to show that you know, actually we can make people's communities better. A lot of these areas that have seen industrial um, decline, places that used to have mining or um, steel or various other industries that were very, very strong, um, and they've maybe seen a decline in more towards the service industry in recent years, jobs going to the city. And it's that positivity really saying that we do want to transform the area and uh, 
I think a long time that nobody likes being told that their area is 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 poor or is you know not got anything good going for it and it was about putting pride back in there as much as anything so I think there is an economic side but there is a very strong cultural link and I think that's the thing that we'll be fighting elections on in future that's right that's that is very uh very interesting something I think all par all conservative parties should uh, take note of um uh, a couple of more questions I wanted to ask you. Uh, if you could say a little bit about the uh, the handling of the of the pandemic, which is uh, you know uh, on top of the agenda, of course, uh, in every country, uh, how that is uh, kind of influencing politics, and and um, and if there's any uh, if you see any uh, difference in how a conservative versus labor um, would uh, tackle such a thing, and. And I, I'll just uh, mention the other, uh, the third and last uh, question I wanted to challenge you on was uh, when it comes to China, we saw that uh, you, you are presenting or Boris Johnson is presenting to parliament next week, the, uh, the uh, strategy on uh, kind of foreign policy stra strategy where, uh, where China is very central and it is seen as a threat to economics in the UK, but at the same time, the conclusion is to do more trade with China. And so that is also something we, uh, I, I would really like, like to hear your comments on, your views on. Sure. I suppose the first thing with the pandemic, it was just the, un the unprecedented nature of it um, and, and the need for some sig significant state intervention as, as a result of that there. And I've seen myself um, supporting things that I, I never expected to do as a conservative. I've always believed in low taxes, a small state, um, free markets, that, that kind of thing. Um, and we were seeing large, large amounts of subsidies. We're, we're paying 80 percent of people's wages and so on. Um, while they're not working. And these are things that, again, as I said, you wouldn't normally expect to support as a conservative. But in this case, we, we did because it, it genuinely felt like the right thing to do. And the circumstances were just so unprecedented. Um, it's been difficult, I think, all over the world knowing how to deal with it. And some quite significant sums of money there. It's going to take a long time to, to pay back. And it's those tough decisions, really, that uh, are going to be coming up in the future. But what it has done is it's, it's taken a little bit of the economic argument away from things, really, uh, because of the vast sums that, that are involved there. Um, I think one thing that actually has been a, a positive, really, is the, the vaccinations that we, we've had in, in the UK. We, we've vaccinated a lot of people and we, we've taken some risks along the way there, I think, uh, with... Um, our own research and development and after leaving the EU we, we decided to go on a certain path with that um, and that's been very successful and we're hoping we're going to open the economy up quicker because of that. Uh, we, we've had a bit of a bounce in the polls um, since we started vaccinating people. Um, we we're probably at our least popular since the election um, not too long before that and I think it's just one of those things in society people are very uh, after such a long period of time um, yeah, a little bit downhearted and so on and we've just got that light at the end of the tunnel now um people are seeing their children go back to school um people will be able to go out for a beer again soon which i know a lot are looking forward to and uh going maybe going to the football again which is my my hobby but uh it's one of those we'll look back on it and we'll say there are things that we could have done better there's there's no doubt about that um but there are also things that we've done well and and we also say hindsight's a wonderful thing i think that's become the there was the nickname of the leader of the opposition has been called Captain Hindsight, I think, for a lot of the criticism that we've, we've had on various issues. Um, but we've now seen very much what we call a vaccine bounce. And we, we have the local elections coming up in May. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, see how people feel with that. So, yeah, there's been a, a big change there um, in terms of China and what that means for for British politics in the future. I think there was there was some controversy with it before we are looking at upgrading to our 5G network and we were looking at the position of uh, the Chinese company Huawei. And that was very controversial, uh, mainly for security reasons. Uh, so there, there was some, some opposition to that in, in parliament. It did pass in the end, uh, but then that was later revoked um, as, as COVID came along and, and various other security concerns so I think it's about that balancing act really we we're saying that we want to uh, get out into the world since leaving the EU we've, we've signed all these trade deals um, you know we want to trade with the world whoever that is um, 
And whilst recognizing, I suppose, the security concerns, whether it's China or Russia or looking at the emerging economies, it's, it's getting that balance right. Um, I think it would be naive to suggest that we can we can cut places off. Um, but at the same time, you know, people we asking things about human rights records of countries. And this isn't a new thing, but I, I think certainly as we look at our new place in the world and the way that um, those sort of power dynamics are are changing that that's that's going to be a really key thing so i'm one of these i i want to get out and trade with the world but um not at not at any cost yeah well thank you so much for those very inspiring uh comments and analysis and um i know that uh, congressman dusty johnson has to leave um in not so long so i i was hoping just to get a short comment from him on this last issue of china before he has to leave um, Congressman Johnson, are you, um, you're still there? I'm here. It would be interesting to hear the view, the U.S. view on what, um, what our, um, uh, on the China question on the, do, do you agree with, uh, what we heard? I, I do. Uh, and in general, I would tell you, I think that Americans don't fully appreciate how large a threat, uh, China uh, poses. And I think uh, one need look no further than what goes on in Hong Kong uh, to understand uh, the, the serious problems uh, that uh, all uh, free people, uh, all freedom loving people should see uh, with China's intentions vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, vis-a-vis -vis the Southeast, vis-a-vis -vis using the Belt and Road Initiative uh, to be able to secure greater leverage over so many, uh, you know, uh, multilateral relationships. And, and, and China is uh, absolutely interested in exercising a tremendous amount of power over uh, not just uh, our uh, five countries, but frankly, over the entirety of the globe. And I don't think we can believe, I think it would be not naive to believe that they would exercise their power uh, under the same uh, Western civilization principles uh, uh, that uh, Sweden or, or Germany or the UK or Norway or the United States do. Thank you. Thank you. We, uh, we now uh, make a, a shift uh, to um, speak to our uh, German friend, uh, Christian Kattner. Are you with us? Here we go. Yes, I'm with you. Right, very good. Hello, uh, so, um, this fall, well, first of all, welcome. <laughs> I, I said that in the, in the beginning, but uh, to our audience and everyone, uh, a very warm welcome. Um, Thank you for having this me. Fall, Germany and Europe will enter the post Merkel era. She has been a formidable <laughs> political force and the de facto leader of the center right European politics, really. What do you think is going to be her legacy and the legacy of, or, and also for Germany? and conservative parties throughout Europe? <laughs> well, uh, well, again, first of all, thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, you are asking a very interesting question, but let me start with another topic first. It, it's also to be, it's great to be back with you, with the Norwegians, with Hoyre. Um, a little caveat right in ahead. I'm not a member of the CDU, I'm a member of the Bavarian sister party, CSU. I can only comment um, from a third party perspective on that one. So uh, I take some freedom in my, my comments on, on the CDU and on Merkel's le legacy. And therefore, um, yeah, it's it's a breaking tide. It's It's an era ends for us as well in Germany. Well, most of our youngsters, teenagers only know Angela Merkel as chancellor. This is this is kind of, uh, yeah, tremendous achievement in politics. And when you go back into her time when she was elected, she took over from a social democratic um, chancellorship when Germany was considered the, uh, the, the poor, the weak, the sick person of Europe. And she developed Germany into a very 
prosperous and, and effective engine for the European Union to drive prosperity, to guide through a very difficult time, especially in the financial crisis. When you see that uh, with, you mentioned fiscal conservatism, with this approach, with the austerity policy of Angela Merkel, we kind of survived this crisis very properly. Well, maybe some Southern European countries might disagree, but in the end, I think fiscal conservatism is, is the essence of Angela Merkel's policy. We have to stick to our resources. We have to be prudent with what we spend. And that's actually the basis for our survival in a crisis right now. When you see um, how much money we are spending right now in the pandemic, it's good to have some resources saved in, in, the, in the good times. And even uh, in the financial crisis, we, we were able to uh, not to overspend our budget. And this is something that is, that is the legacy of Angela Merkel in, in this part of the policy field and the financial and economical side. On the other side, you have other crises where she faced uh, tremendous challenges, but she has shown a lot of leadership. This was the migration crisis in 2015 on. So the, even if you don't agree with all her decisions, but she gave politics a human face again into the, uh, for, for those people in dire needs who we can help and, but do not overspend again our hospitality. We must be critical on what we are doing, how much people we take in, but uh, we have to think about how to solve the problems where they're coming from, from the source. Where's, where was the source of the migration crisis? It was not in Europe, but it's swapped over Europe. So this is, this is a very rational, natural scientist approach to politics. And this, yeah, definitely that's, that's the legacy of Angela Merkel. And if I look at the possible candidates in Germany, we do not have the same kind of leader, type of leader right now. It's a more, uh, the rationality of a natural scientist is not given to all candidates around uh, currently. So I'm not quite sure if we at one point will miss this kind of leadership from Angela Merkel because it's mm -hmm. down to earth, it's very prudent, it's very humble. And therefore we will see what's coming next. <laughs> Well, um, well, some of those last words you said uh, also uh, uh, kind of good uh, conservative principles, uh, prudent and down to earth. And um, we we are very excited to see uh, what kind of how kind of, what kind of conservative politics we see in the future in uh, in Germany. And um, uh, also, what do you think should be a conservative stance on on climate change? Um, since you have um, often on the on the left side more activists, while on the right side you have more um, uh, politics is more concerned about uh, uh, results that can be measured. Um, mm -hmm. And um, in Germany, it's interesting that you had that uh, the right side has been able to cooperate with the Green Party. And the Green Party is a pragmatic one. Um, in Norway, for instance, we have a Green Party that is uh, not very, pr pr very pragmatic and uh, is uh, mm -hmm. is clearly on on the side of of the uh, of the left of the socialist parties. So I was wondering if you could um, comment on a bit about about that. It's actually a very interesting question when you look into the history of German politics, uh, the topic of environmental policy is older than I am, and I'm now 45 years old. Actually, it was a Bavarian CSU conservative government who set up the first ministry for environment. It was a state ministry. So we very early had on our agenda in our political platforms, the preservation of our cultural heritage. And this is when you come to Bavaria, I, I assume a lot of you have been traveled around the Alps, have been maybe at the Oktoberfest. 
um, all this scenery, all this environment needs to be preserved. And we are proud of this cultural heritage. And therefore, we have tried to secure this, the woods, the lakes, the mountains, everything. That is under uh, preservation because we live with it. We live with this environment. But we are not blind for development and for change. And therefore, the Greens ran on this topic, climate and uh, environmental policy in the 70s and peace policy. They were one topic political parties and they have developed to a very ideological parties. Climate change for them, like the Friday for Future movements and the Greens today, they just treat this as an ideology. No, it's not an ideology. It's, it's, our, it's our heritage. It's our conservative belief that this is very important to our survival of our culture. But we also need to be open to combine this with the economy. Ecology and economy do not contradict each other. We can live with both and we make we have to make them both work together. So this is something from, from a conservative understanding in Germany and I think also in Europe that we will give an answer, a broader answer, not only to climate change. We will also secure social, um, our social standards by preserving uh, jobs. I think it was our American friend from the US uh, who said it's make work work is work is social. This is something we need to combine with our saving of the environment. And I think this is possible. We can invest in green economy. We can invest in in yeah uh, changes in in the technical development. So research development. This is something how we can bring this together. And I think. We have seen this, and you mentioned a green, black and green government in Germany on the state level in the state of Baden-Württemberg. You have a green prime minister and a junior partner from the CDU. This is the next to Bavaria, the car country of Germany. They are producing Porsche and Mercedes Benz in this country. And this comes along and we now have seen that the, well, the, the, the engine, the diesel engine is still a very good engine but we see that we have to change this to uh, electric cars, we have to uh, hydro energy, whatever. This is coming, change is coming. And therefore, I, I read lately something very interesting uh, by a German historian professor who said conservative, and especially in the environmental surrounding, um, is that conservatives are not against change. We are open to change but we are not following blindly the zeitgeist, the immediate demand of the left. Mm. We delay the zeitgeist until the point, until it's not damaging our environment, our economy and our social life. So this is the, uh, the conservative approach, how we can deal with the Greens. And I think this is, it's a, it's a proper approach and I hope we are successful with this in Germany. It's a very, um... A very in interesting answer you have there on on um, climate and environment. Um, my last question on uh, for 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 now at least uh, would be uh, to challenge you to say a little bit about how you see things from a standpoint of the International Democratic Union, which is <laughs> an umbrella for moderate parties throughout the world, and especially uh, when it comes to the, the, the Western part of that family of conservative parties, do you see, are, they, are those parties going in a certain direction now? I mean, because politics is always dynamic and moving, is it going in, into one direction or, or, is, or are they going, or are the parties uh, coming further apart? Uh, hmm. and going into various directions? And, and if there's one direction, and what are those directions? Yeah, right. All right. Uh, also, a very broad question. Just let me make another detour right in the beginning here. Um, I have two hats on. I, first, I was speaking as the International Secretary of the CSU. This is my part time job. My main job is Secretary General of the International Democrat Union, as you mentioned. And 
I think most of you, especially in Norway, have heard about it since the IDU secretariat was for, I think, 12, 15 years based in Oslo at the Hoyra headquarters. Yes. My predecessor, Eirik Mohn, is probably well known to all of you. Absolutely. And I've learned a lot from him and, and therefore I feel very uh, attached to, to Norway and, and to, uh, to the Hoyra party. So thanks again for, for all the support you've given to us, to the IDU. And now coming to your question. Well, um, <laughs> the direction of the international or the Western civilized conservative parties in Northern America and Europe, um, I think we will face a, a huge discussion. What is conservative with? conservatives and we heard from our British friend and from from the from our friend from the US what's what's driving their ideas of conservatives free market limited government <clears throat> I would add for from a European perspective multiple uh, um, NATO and NATO was mentioned as well before so those are these common goods those are these ideas of working globally together I think we all can agree on this is the Reagan idea of working globally together. And I think this will still drive the international conservative movement and the IDU is committed to these uh, developments. We have to stand up for freedom, for democracy, the rule of law, we can all agree on. But if you look deeper into some countries, you see uh, emphasizing some topics more, some topics less, but nevertheless, the basis for international conservatism is the same. And when you, uh, some have criticized President Trump for not being conservative, some called him a populist Democrat in our uh, spheres, and well, uh, he had a different approach. This is um he's a man who who motivated crowds and i've been elected in 2016 at the cleveland convention of the conservative party and i've seen this event i've seen the spirit and the dynamic of the conservative and the republican party this is this is amazing this is something uh, the conservative spirit i think in in europe can see something this motivation this yeah, joy and fun and 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 passion for for these ideas. But um, we have to combine this with those global principles I've mentioned before. So we have on an ideological base, we have really topics we can agree on, and we have to combine it with some passion and engagement from the US. I think then the the Western conservative parties, as you mentioned, it's North America and Europe, we definitely have a future. And um, that's the reason, for example, why the IDU is planning to go each year once to the US. We want to have our IDU forum each December after the Thanksgiving holidays in the US in Washington DC to combine this, to bring those like-minded Republicans together with a passion for freedom and democracy, for rule of law, for free markets, whatever you name it. And we have we have had great speeches, for example, from Liz Cheney, the number three in the in the Republican Party. We had Mitt Romney, we had Mike Pompeo, and uh, uh, Secretary Chao, for example, the transport minister. So this is you, you see all those politicians and the, the, the framework around this is the IRI, where we can work together closely and we have a common ideology. This is strong and this will survive and this will go in the same broader direction. You, I don't see this splitting, and, but the road is maybe a little bit broader than we might have thought five years ago, but it's the same direction. And when it comes to politics and policy fields, NATO, China, Russia, those three topics are the most challenging for us conservatives right now and where we have to find a common answer on that. And for example, China is now the next IDU forum in April and it's, it's a huge request and interest in this already. Even we only have sent out the save the date for this. So 
conservative can agree on common topics and I hope we will be successful. Thank you very, very much. Um, uh, and, and with those words, we will uh, move on uh, to our next uh, panelist uh, from uh, Sweden. Um, and uh, Hans Wallmark, are you, are, you, are you there? Hi, hi. Yes, I'm here, but um, some problem with the video. Um, you okay. can't start your video because the host has disabled it. Okay, so, uh, but uh, we uh, I, we hear you very clearly. No, and no. Very good. Um, so, um, uh, a big welcome. Uh, so, I would like to um, uh, to start off to say that, that the Moderaterna uh, is the conservative party that uh, Høyre, the Norwegian conservative party, is closest to. Uh, of course, we, uh, we uh, are inspired by our friends in Germany and the UK and in the United States uh, by both Republicans and Democrats, uh, both those parties. Um, but I wanted to ask you, since we, Höyre in Norway and Moderaterna in Sweden, never seem to be in government at the same time, historically, <laughs> uh, but we, all, we, also, we always draw a lot of experience from what you do we seek insight from moderaternas viewpoint uh, which conservative parties do you draw um, most inspiration from well uh, first go kväll oslo that are stockholm 12 points to norway from sweden <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well first uh, it's it's absolutely true. You have the uh, general election to to your parliament uh, to starting it uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, our general election to our parliament Riksdagen next year. Uh, so let us change now so that we after the Swedish election next year can have both our parties in government of the 2022 with our party leaders as prime ministers. I think this is a common goal. Uh, and, but to be honest, if, if more than when we end up in government next year, uh, then we have been in opposition for eight years. So I very much believe that uh, there will be a close dialogue with our Norwegian colleagues uh, on your experience uh, of governing. Uh, last time we had a government was between 2006 and 2014. And uh, you're totally right, Bord, that we find a lot of inspiration from you as you also find hopefully some inspiration from our uh, party. And uh, we have close contacts at all levels uh, from the party leadership to the local organizations uh, in the border regions. So I really hope and think that you're going to see if the borders are open, that you're going to see uh, moderates uh, in Oslo from Värmland and Bohuslän that uh, taking part of your election campaign as they always have done. And um, it's also important to know that Erna Solberg is probably one of the most popular foreign leaders that Swedes knows. Um, but to end your question, uh, I also want to add another thing. As you probably know, I'm also the chairman of the conservative group in the Nordic Council, and Michael Tetchner is uh, my deputy chairman from, from Höyre. And I must say, and this is extremely important, that Höyre is doing a tremendous good job inside our party group in the Nordic Council. And the Nordic parties from all the five Nordic countries are very close to each other. Uh, and um, for me, it's also very important to say that we are strong, strong NATO supporters, not only in Norway and Denmark and Iceland, but also from the moderates in Sweden and from Kukumus in, in Finland. And we have also a very strong EU support, uh, not only from Finland and Denmark and Sweden, but also from you, Höyre, in Norway. Thank you very much. Um, and um, 
Uh, I'm sure both uh, Eric Moen and uh, and uh, Mikal uh, Tetschner are uh, are with us. Um, I hope so. And um, I would like to challenge you on one other uh, perhaps controversial uh, issue, uh, both in Norway and Sweden and in Germany, there are, um, we have a populist, uh, uh, some somewhat anti-immigration parties to the right. And um, they cannot be, um, they cannot be, uh, uh, compared as, uh, as equal, they are quite uh, different in, in form in those three countries. Um, and with uh, the, the populist party in the, the progress party in Norway being the kind of uh, least controversial and, and we and in Norway we have also they have been in government with the conservative party. Um, how do you view this uh, with the, the Sweden Democrats in, in Sweden? Uh, do you foresee that there will be a change in your stance towards cooperation and um, and and how is that party um, evolving as well, as well? Well, I think it's as you also mentioned. I think it's important to see the difference also between the Framstegs party at the Norway uh, the Progressive Party and the Swedish Democrats, Sverige Demokraterna in Sweden. Uh, it's because it's about the roots. Uh, FRP, the, the Progressive Party, has its roots back in time in Anders Lange and his party, so it's a more populist party. Uh, the Swedish Democrats has its roots back in the 1970s in, uh, in um, a more racist, uh, even fascist uh, 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 part. So therefore, it, it, is, it is a difference, but uh, both parties have evolved. Um, the, the strategy from the moderate party is quite simple. Uh, we talk with all parties and we try to form majorities for our proposals with all parties in the parliament. Uh, for the moment, we have eight parties in, in the Swedish parliament. Um, and it is clear for us that we need the support from the Swedish Democrats in order to form a center-right wing government after the election 2022. And uh, we have also clearly stated that we want to form this government together with the other uh, number two EPP party in Sweden, the Swedish Christian Democrats, a smaller party than, than, than the moderate party. Uh, and we need to have support from the Swedish Democrats for that. Uh, that they are not going to be part of the government, but they are part of um, what we can hope to be the majority in the parliament. Uh, and I think it's important to accept the, the, the reality of the parliament, uh, but uh, some parties still find it hard to do so. But I think it's also important that we, that we are honest and say that uh, you can see this changing of uh, new political realities. And we have adopted this in Sweden maybe later than our neighboring countries, especially when it comes came to, to uh, migration and integration. Um, increased immigration and massive challenges regarding integration uh, has led to a growing support for, for Swedish Democrats. It's, it's, no doubt about, about that. Um, and um, they have been criticizing the Swedish immigration policy with a, a quite successful uh, populist approach. But um, I think that, to be honest also, that uh, we have now started, including the moderates, to address these challenges related to immigration much later than our neighboring countries. Uh, but um, I, I, I have quite high hopes that we're going to, to have the opportunity to establish a, a center right wing government uh, with the moderates and the Christian Democrats. And hopefully we're going to seek support from the Swedish Democrats and also maybe with some support from, from the Liberal Party if they can pass the threshold on the 4% uh, to the parliament. 
Thank you. Uh, last last question on on uh, NATO, as as you uh, as you know, and as, as this we... is a very good question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good good. So we've all heard that a very central part of conservatism is is uh, the the security alliances um, among uh, countries who share uh, democratic values. Um, and um, I know that uh, Buderatana is uh, um, is more likely to uh, to be in favor of uh, NATO membership. Uh, how how is your position? What is your position on NATO? And do you think there may be a shift now that both in the foreseeable future, now that both Russia and China um, are of greater concern than just uh, a decade ago? Well, uh, firstly, uh, it's extremely simple to, to answer in your first question. The moderate party uh, are strong in favor of a Swedish NATO membership. And we have advocating that for that for, for, for years. And I think it was Dusty Johnson that mentioned that to be conservative is to be part of the Western democracies. And, and NATO is really um, protecting the Western democracies. So for us, it's naturally. And, and secondly, Swedes are internationalists. We, we like to cooperate inside international bodies uh, like the European Union, uh, like Nordic Council, like uh, OSSE, uh, like the Council of Europe, like uh, United Nations. And therefore it's so odd uh, that we are not part of NATO, which are a strong cooperation in defense for our continent and our values. And uh, sometimes I'm also saying to my Swedish social democratic colleagues that it's extremely odd. Um, and you, you know that we have, we have so talent and so wise social democratic people. The odd thing is that they are living in Denmark and Norway. Because the truth is that the pillar of security and defense for even social democrats in Norway and Denmark is to be part of NATO. This is the real truth. But for Swedish social democrats, this is a lie. Um, so yeah, and therefore it is important for us to be the advocates of uh, a Swedish NATO membership. Um, the opinion polls shows that uh, for the moment uh, it's around 40% in favor and 40% against, and 20% is indifferent, uh, has no view on, on this, uh, on, on the membership. But uh, we, we work on this. And all four center right wing parties inside the Swedish parliament, the moderates, the Christian Democrats, the center party and the liberal party, we are all in favor for a Swedish NATO membership. So we we working on it. And it's exactly as you mentioned, Borg. Uh, it's also about not only to protect our values, our continent, but also to clearly see the enemies against us. And that is the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China. Thank you very much for your very firm stance on, uh, on NATO and, uh, and a very inspiring uh, remarks. Uh, uh, I would say to new viewers that uh, we have now had a um, a fantastic run through uh, con what conservative policies um, should be and are uh, in our era. We've talked to our friends uh, from conservative parties, both in Sweden and uh, in the in Germany, in the UK, and in you know in the United States of America. We are now uh, done with the panel discussion, and uh, uh, our friends in the panel are, of course very welcome to continue to watch as we introduce our, our next guest. Uh, that is going to be our friend from Democrats Abroad uh, Norway, 
and, and um, I would like to welcome uh, Jonathan Roth. Roth, are you Hi. here? Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me and uh, inviting me behind the wire here. I know that I'm uh, maybe perhaps a little bit to the left of you, uh, particularly, but it's a, it's been an enlightening listen. I, I, I first want to um, compliment Congressman Johnson. I don't know if he's still on. Uh, I He's a, a Republican from North Dakota. And uh, back in my Washington days, I used to work for Democrats from New York, so we couldn't be more different. But my ear is finally tuned to legitimate lawmakers and people who are working and trying to get things done and are, are very well briefed. And he spoke very eloquently about things that we could all uh, agree on. Um, uh, just it happens to me, my opinion, that uh, he is in, in, in a big minority and we have a big problem. I'm happy to answer your questions, um, but I just wanted to put that out there first. He was uh, very impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And um, uh, I would like to say both to you, but also to the viewers that Höyre, uh, the Conservative Party, um, uh, we have a very strong uh, cooperation with uh, Moderaterna in Sweden, but also, also Conservative parties in other countries. When it comes to the United States of America, we have uh, traditionally had our cooperation with the Republicans, but it is natural for us to also have contact with uh, the, the the Democrats, and I'm sure you will understand that very well when you look at uh, politics in Norway. I, I I think maybe we're yes maybe the whole spectrum of politician is is politicians is probably to to the left of the most uh, conservative uh, Republicans, yeah. um, but uh, but we uh, we have had that tradition of speaking to both parties since uh, uh, the United States is our. Uh, most important ally, and we need to cooperate with whoever is running uh, the the White House, and um, and we find the policies that we agree with and disagree with in both parties. So uh, that uh, being said, um, as you mentioned, uh, Dusty Johnson gave uh, quite an interesting um, uh, analysis of uh, of where we are and said that the road ahead is very uncertain. And you have stated that uh, you would want the Republican Party to you to unite again and to present what you call a rational opposition. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and what you mean by that. Yes, well, I mean, from what you heard from uh, Representative Johnson, that used to be uh, pretty much an assumed middle of the road uh, Republican uh, or, or our understanding of what a Republican congressman uh, was, someone who was very well briefed relatively moderate understanding of the issues and willing to uh, hold fast to their uh, their understanding of their principles, yet kind of work to find uh, moderate understanding with the other side. Um, we are at a very perilous place in the United States. I can speak uh, for the United States here, but it might have it might have some overlap elsewhere. Um, there's really an attack on uh, our understanding of uh, popular sovereignty and the democratic and the democratic experiment in the United States. I, I, I want to echo uh, Congressman Johnson's uh, uh, point that everything flows from optimism, and I would I, I would suggest that um, from the beginning of uh, the founding of the United States and most democracies, once we unmoored ourselves from like a sovereign, we became uh, popularly sovereign and it unleashed the creativity and innovation of the human mind. We were able to educate ourselves and chart our own path and decide how we were gonna be doing policies going forward. And every generation upon generation was able to build upon that knowledge base and the innovations created uh, societies through the last couple of centuries that culminated in democracies being atop the heap, right? And unfortunately, what we have seen over the last few years has been the dark side of, pop, of popular sovereignty. Anything is possible with optimism. What we've seen, we create, we we find modern science, and we put a man in the moon, et cetera, et cetera. But this is all about government uh, for us and by us. And so, when if anything is possible with optimism, then anything is also possible with cynicism. What you have on the Republican side in the United States now is a prevailing attitude that the only obje objective is to fight. There's no idea to try to moderate. There's no idea to try to find consensus in uh, lawmaking. So you find yourself in a situation where 
uh, a very, very large uh, country that has a lot of freedoms and does not have extreme cultural connections over like, like some countries in Europe might that kind of hold the countries together politically and give it some elasticity. America's uh, uh, political culture is inelastic. And when you have uh, a, 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 one, one party who's unwilling to do anything but fight and in fight, you wind up with a situation which uh, the, the, the governing body is kind of walking all over it, like you saw last week in which we passed a $1.9 trillion uh, stimulus package with no organized opposition from the conservatives. They were fighting amongst themselves. And the pro, I mean, there's a relative luxury in, in Europe and in, in U, yeah, Norway and elsewhere with a parliamentary system in which you find yourself like in Germany where the CDU, CSU is the last like, huge uh, Volke Partia, but it's not as if everyone else gets shut out when they win, you can form coalitions and there's kind of some mixing, mixing and matching going there. In the United States, if you are uh, out, you're totally out. So if you're not animating the optimism in people, you're essentially animated, animating the pessimism in people and everything is possible, even an attack on the, uh, the, the, the seat of government. The last thing I'll say is that the Republican party has a very, very long, uh, a very, very long history of being a very, very innovative party, even in the minority. From 1933 to 1995, the, the House of Representatives was basically a democratic institution. For only four years, the Republicans held the House. But because of moderate masters of the Congress, such as Illinois Congressman Bob Michael, who many would, would call one of the great congressmen, we were able to moderately move the country forward. Everyone got a little piece of what they were asking for. The executive was able to change hands you know, from Eisenhower, Republican, Kennedy, Democrat, you had Nixon, you had Carter, Reagan, everyone, all these switches. The Republicans, not too long ago, were known as the party of big ideas. Hmm. And that lineage with all the intellectual heft and the, the civil society groups and everything, gave, it, it gave everyone on that side of the aisle a ticket to the mar marketplace of ideas. But ever since the President Trump showed up, Everything was going to be beautiful, no details on anything, no party platform. They're just absent now. And as recently as, 20, uh, as 2012, you had the Ryan budget, many of you might remember, which was a, a, a whole prescription to overhaul the entitlement state in the United States. I mean, I personally didn't agree with it, but you have to take it seriously as a governing philosophy. So you can debate something, but now there's nothing to debate. And there might be a minority of people who are who are true blue public servants like uh, Representative Johnson, but they're in the minority now. Uh, you, what you had 170 con uh, uh, 170 Congress people vote to overturn an election on no evidence after a raid on the Congress. So we're in a very perilous place right now because, like I said, it's very inelastic in the United States. We've had times in which we've been culturally divided, and we. Historically, we, we've gone through many troubles in the 1960s, et cetera, where we were culturally divided, but now our culture has been replaced by politics. And if a, a political party starts to atrophy and it gets itself into a place in which it can't foresee winning an, an executive election and you kind of get at 45% or less in this winner take all system, anything is possible. Popular sovereignty again, and people resort to things that are not uh, in, within the democratic process. And that's what we're seeing now. It's very, very scary. Um, and because of the way that the party system in the United States has been financed because of the internet financing, the uh, traditional ways that the parties used to keep moderation in their parties is they would decide where the money went to and they would be able to pick rational people to run for these seats. But now with independent expenditure groups and uh, dark money and things of this nature. Plus the pres the former president now literally going out and saying, don't give money to the party, give all your money to me. You find yourself in a situation in which the Republicans are having to uh, uh, figure out which, which people will have the money and which people are electable. Mm. And it's kind of a Gordian knot. And we're going to have to, we're going to find out soon enough uh, who wins, but it's a scary time. Absolutely. Uh, um, 
on the on the positive side, it seems that President Biden is relatively popular and 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 somewhat uh, uniting uh, a uniting figure, uh, at least uh, when you look at what you had before. Um, so so that it, um, but you know maybe he might be for now doing a good job at uniting the country more. Uh, the the party, the Democratic Party, also seems to have a lot of um, a, a cleavage between the um, kind of Bernie Sanders AOC uh, left um, more on identity politics, and then you also have. I don't know if you have blue dog Democrats anymore in the party, but at least I think Biden would be seen as a, a moderate in um, in that uh, in, in the party at least. Um, do you think the modern the Democratic Party can uh, can bridge this and also unite the party, not only the country? Well, I think that uh, to be quite blunt, um, we have the benefit of seeing our democracy almost slip away. So uh, like a, a couple of months ago from the other side, we do have uh, some people who are more far left than usual. We, we're, we essentially have a changing of the guard, especially in my state of New York. A lot of old line moderates have been replaced by um, more uh, left leaning liberal people. Um, but we are not in the same kind of league as where the Republicans were, I guess you would say, in, right after the Tea Party Revolution a decade ago where people, a small group, were willing to tank legislation of their own side and weaponize themselves against their own party. As you can see with the way that the uh, Nancy Pelosi is running the House of Representatives, there's a lot of unity there. there when, when, the, when the Senate um, amended the, the COVID-19 um, legislation, everyone uh, on the far left had voted for that. We understand that in order to get back to a place of governability, we have to get things done. Good government is the lifeblood of any democracy. I mean, and at least the bottom line is to show that you're trying to do something. You can't have, you can't have nothing and you, can't, you also can't have negative government, which is what we had, which is basically antagonizing other people. So at the very least, don't antagonize people, okay? Uh, and that's what, and, and so, that's why Joe Biden is 60% plus. You know, you're not gonna, there are definitely gonna be people on, on the political right who are gonna pocket the cash and still find things to be angry about. And we're not gonna win everybody. We're not gonna win everybody. But like he said in his inaugural speech, historically America has been able to cobble together enough of a majority of people to bring all the rest of the people along with them. And that is what we have to hope. We have to kind of take a long view here. The, the big X factor is if, uh, enough of the Trump aligned people with their negative view of politics and their somewhat nihilistic gov uh, anti-governing philosophy uh, are able to um, overtake some of the, a, a, a big chunk of the moderates that exist. I mean, I used to work in the house and I know about the Main Street Partnership and the Republican Study Committee and these people are serious people on the right. Like they have ideas, they have an animating govern governing philosophy for how uh, the United States government should work. They have proposals, generally speaking, for different types of reforms, but that's essentially missing and they're sidelined. And those, those type of things were empowered on as recently as the Ryan years. We we're talking about three and a half years ago, but it's essentially like it ran off a cliff. And I don't know how you get back. It's not, not my job necessarily as a Democrat to like, you know, give the policy prescription, but it's really on the leadership. And what you've seen is they, they're, they're, they're taking such a short-term view of their political fortunes. Kevin McCarthy sees, for some reason, that he thinks that he can become the Speaker of the House and he only needs to win five seats. And so he can show no backbone against the Trump side of the party, but it's really from a rational perspective, people like me, relatively moderate Democrats and even more moderate Republicans probably see the, the uh, absurdity of the of, of the position taking, you know, yep. more is going to get done. People are going to be are, are going to remember these big laws that are being passed, and that the Democrats were there, and that they were complaining about things on Fox News and yelling into the wind, and and not winning enough people. And that's all that I can see as a as an objective observer here. 
Could, could I uh, challenge you in the end because we are we are soon going to switch to a Norwegian commentator, um, and um, I don't want to put you on the spot here uh, to say anything about the, the Norwegian parties, uh, which one you favor or anything. But uh, if there's anything you can say about Norwegian politics uh, seen from a Democrat in Norway, uh, is there anything you can share with us? Well, listen, I uh, I'm lo I'm loath to comment too much on uh, on on the on the politics, generally speaking, as a, as a, as someone who's not a citizen at the moment. But what I will say is, I used to work at the United Nations, and um, there is a reverence for Norway um, in the international community um, writ large. Working in foreign policy in the um, in the Congress, there is a a gold standard honest broker kind of title that Norway has. And you, I ascribe it as, a, a, as an observer to the uh, stability of the politics here. Um, and there, there, there is legitimate um, difference between uh, parties across the spectrum, but it's stable enough that Norway can take its, its, uh, name and go out and make big things happen internationally. And I think that it's the indispensable nation um, when it comes to peace and diplomacy. I think it's showed that and it's recognized. Um, and I think that everyone knows that. So um, I happen to be a very moderate guy and I'm still always still learning about Norwegian politics. Um, you know, as you said, um, the Hoiro would be more of like a, a, a traditional blue dog democratic uh, disposition with regards to taxation, but also um, Folke Trigden is, you know, that's a that's more of a democratic thing than the Republican thing, as you well know. Uh, I, I think that the way that that Norwegian politics is operated is very is very it's, it's very regal. You know, you guys respect the, you respect yourselves and you respect each other. And the media isn't as diabolical as it is in the United States. And so um, people can kind of be more who they are politically. And um, the, the stability is a nice place to live, I will tell you that. But that's about the extent of which I can comment. That's great. It's so great to, uh, uh, to have you here on the discussion so much. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing. Thank you. Uh, Okay, we will move on uh, and I will go over to speaking uh, Norwegian. Uh, Velkommen, Asle Toya. Tack så mye. Ja, veldig bra. Uh, du har jo, altså jeg kunne, jeg kunne holde på et ti minutter og introdusere deg, men uh, jeg bare sier det at du er medlem av Nobelkomiteen, og uh, du er en med stor autoritet uh, og forsker og stor autoritet på å snakke om, uh, om konservatisme. Mm. Uh, og um, og uh, så skulle egentlig Janne Håland Matladi være med oss. Hun fikk et illebefinnende, så uh, det blir uh, oss to. Um, så sender vi våre varme tanker til Janne. Absolutt. Så eh, vi hørte at, at hun var blant folk og, og, som tar seg av hun, så det håper vi virkelig at alt går bra. Ja. Um, så eh, Asle, jeg vil starte med å utfordre deg litt på de store linjene som jo er noe som du er god på. Um, nu har, hvis vi går tilbake til min introduksjon som vi startet med, altså mm. nu er liksom vi hade liksom efter andra världskrig kommunistiska partier i Europa som fick en sån över runt 15 och och försökte liksom och och när de inte klarade oss att ta över det politiska systemet med i demokratier så försökte de sig på någon kupp och för klarade någon steg och nu är liksom nu har vi liksom rött på sån runt spärrgränsa och de är liksom för demokrati och rättsstat och allt det här alltså treng vi konservativa partier har det utspelat sin roll vi har liksom vi har marknadsekonomi och demokrati vi har rättigheter eh liksom är er, är er jobben gjort för konservativa partier vad vad gänstår liksom Det är frågan är gott vad ser med seger här efter efter segern för Europas konservativa partier så var slutet på den kalla krigen ett ett ögonblick av eh, rådlöshet man visste inte vad moderna konservatism skulle vara utan sin antitese kommunismen. 
Eh, nu er det jo slik at vi fortsatt har en kommunistisk supermakt, eh, men de fleste konservative har bare vendt sig til å bare se bort ifra det. Eh, og, og slik som jeg har skrevet, så er Høyres historie ikke ulik den historien som mange, eh, mange konservative partier har hatt, der den liberale fløyen ble tonangivende, og etter hvert så, så skrumpet den konservative fløyen inn til å bli mer falmede, falmede bannere og, eh, og, og et partinavn som hade konservativ klang, men lite konservativ politik stod tillbaka. Men så var det slik at eh, i det øyeblikket eh, da konservatismen syntes å ha utspilt sin rolle historisk, så sammensverget omstendighetene sig for å skyve konservative perspektiver eh, tillbaka i centrum. Jeg sikter her til, til globaliseringen, og globa- eh, som fick sin tilsvarende ideologi i form av globalisme, dyrket av liberalere. Man fick multikulturalisme som en antitese till den nasjonsbærende nasjonalstaten. Du fick massinvandring och utfordringer med integrering. Och till sist så fick man utfordringer i forhold til selve samfunnskontrakten. Vad kan vi vente fra en borger i våre samfund? Alle er enige om at vi skal yte etter evne og kreve til plikt, men, men vad? Skal vi yte? Alle disse spørsmålene har blitt svært aktuelle i løpet av de siste 50-10 årene, og det er jo primært de konservative partiene som har vært vinnere på dette. Jeg synes det er sånn underlig. Vi, I juni 2018 så hadde Economist for, for siden The Global Crisis of Conservatism, som jo er en underlig ting å skrive all den tid at hvis vi går 20 år tilbake, 1998, så var Europa rødt fra Nordkapp til Gibraltar. Eh, og i 2018, da de kan mest mente at de konservative var i krise, så styrer er Europa blått eh, eh, like monokront som det det var for 20 år siden. Så åpenbart så er det jo ikke noen særlig, synes ikke velgerne at konservatismen er i noen som helst krise, eh, men den krisen som de kan mest sikter til er den krisen som gör at denne sessionen har varit så sprikende, eh, og det mener jeg ikke eh, på, på, til forklaring på, på, av noen av bidragningssyklerne, men vi har fått illustrert at hva konservatisme betyr er et nasjonalt anliggende. Amerikanerne er veldig bundet opp i den tidligere presidenten og hans arv. Britene er veldig bundet opp i brexit-spørsmålet. Tyskerne har denne underlige eh, eh, bindingen til, med, til Motti, som er i ferd med å gå fra, fra bordet, og som oversikker all, all annen politikk, mye mer enn ideologi. Og i Sverige så har de da denne underlige, eh, og, og veldig, for oss eh, en, en, en serie som kanskje har litt mange, for mange episoder i sesongen, der, der, de, der moderaterne må erkjenne for sig selv at de kommer ikke til makten uten Sverigedemokraterne. Dette er jo en pille som Høyre svelget for lenge siden, at du bare erkjente at eh, hvis, man, hvis, hvis vi vil ha makt, så må vi forholde oss til Fremskrittspartiet. Og dette fortjente jo til å moderere Fremskrittspartiet, og det tjente til å føre Høyre til det punktet hvor vi er nå. Eh, og det er noe som kanskje eh, vil fremstå så litt underlig for seerne at etter, nå, her står Høyre, i all sin prakt, på høyden av sin makt, aldri har det gått bedre med partiet Høyre. Eh, Høyre er gjennomgående på meningsmålingene større enn Arbeiderpartiet. Det er en statsbærende parti med, med, med en populær statsminister, sterke kort på viktige poster, utenriksministeren, helseministeren, forsvarsministeren, alle sammen går, gjør en god jobb. Eh, så åpenbart er ikke partiet Høyre i noen som helst krise. Eh, men den konservative fløyen i Høyre er i krise. Og det er kanskje derfor vi, vi, vi er her. Interessant. Eh, altså for, å, for å ta, altså, for jeg tror du er inne på altså det her med konservativ. Når du ser konservatisme som vi har sett i Storbritannia og i USA, hvor eh, man får mer arbeiderklassestemmer, og helt klart har tyngdepunktet i det rurale, eh, så... Eh, i Norge så 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 är så är inte det helt tillfälle ända i vart fall men vill du se si att det alltså kan vi lära oss i Norge av att man har klart att ta jag tänker särskilt på Storbritannien han som vi hade som vant det valdistriktet där som hade varit Labour i 90 år alltså ehm um, och och Arbetarpartiet har ju uppenbart en krise 
kan vi se att högre klarar så ta någon av de välgen som eh, som det snack om här eh, och ha måtte i så fall till för det att det handlar om något du var inne på det handlar om om Brexit det handlar om eh, invandring en del såna frågor och eh, vad ska till för att för att man högre i Norge också upplever det. Jag tror inte att någon av dessa lärdomarna är er relevanta för högre Grunden til dette har å gjøre med eh, en fyr fra samme del av Hakkebakke i skogen som det er selv, Stein Rokkan og, og, og delelinjer i norsk politisk historie. I Norge så er sentrum periferidimensjonen den dominerende eh, kløften i norsk politik. Eh, og all den tid Senterpartiet finnes, og Senterpartiet er seg bevisst eh, at, eh, at det er mye velgere i distriktene å hente, så tror jeg at Høyre vil slite med å bli eh, en fanebærer av for det rurale Jag tror ej heller inte att Höjres historia eh, gör Höjre trovärdig som arbetarklassens sanna representant. Snarare så vill jag kanske överraska enkelt med oss med att advara. Då eh, Olof Palme tog över ett tag i landet så övertog han ett parti på höjden av sitt makt. Och eh, så får Palme det för sig att partiet må är er inte i tiden för att vi ska vi ska kunna fortsätta så må vi må vi må vi komma upp med en stor ny idé total katastrofe eh, för eh, för sossarna eh, och han på många måter så så la berättade han vägen för det extremt problematiska åt in och 90-talet för sossarna. Igen vi ser det när med när 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 ett ett et Thatcher i Storbritannien så ser vi också att de konservativa försöker sig på att bli någonting som de inte är er trovärdiga på och ta på valg eh, länge eh, under Tony Blair. Och jag tror faren för höyre är er att eh, man nå eh, overser vad det är er som har gjort höyre så populära för det är er också konservativt. Ikke I Norge är er det inte bara i Norge men också internationellt så är er det olika konservativa demografier. Eh, selvfølgelig så är er det slik att de flesta av oss som har en konservativ eh, orientering eller läggning eh, er crossover i dette. Men på den siden så har du da de, de kulturkonservative kreftene, som det, det er, på dette feltet har Senterpartiet troverdighet. Mm. Eh, Senterpartiet har troverdighet som et målparti, eh, som et representant for målrøsla. Høyre var for riksmål, ikke sant? Eh, 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 så det kulturkonservative har stått sterkest i Senterpartiet. Det sosialkonservative har varit väldigt bundet opp i kristenfolket i Norge, og handler mye om, eh, om allting, allting som har med seksualitet å gjøre. Eh, igen så har höger följt sig ganska obekväma i att gå in i, I folks sovrum eh, och det är er något som går igen sen om höger har varit progressiva på homofil och transsexuellas rättigheter så ser du att höger har en en motvilje mot att och vara fanebärare på på detta. Så har man fått framväxt en nationalkonservativ flöj som försökt att finna gehör i centrum i Fremskrittspartiet utan utan att göra detta. Det finns nationalkonservativa i i alla i alla norska partier. Eh, det är er de som menar att bevaring av nationalstaten är er det är er det centrala eh, konservativa projektet. Och så till sist så har du de klassiska konservativa som är er det högre värt och där där finner du Nils August Andresen och 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 Isaksen och Henrik Syse, ikring. Eh, detta är er de som menar att konservatismen må bygge på institutioner det och det och bevara institutionen och hålla disse hålla sig institutionerna välfungerande och rena är er ett konservativt projekt och där er där höger har sin störste trovärdighet. Och jag tror att hvis hvis, hvis höger beveger sig bort ifrån detta så tror jag att partiet lätt kan ända upp i den situationen som det är er en vandrhistoria om att Berge Brende en dag uppdagat att att höger inte hade någon trovärdighet det hade 1 % trovärdighet bland de som mente väljarna som mente att höger var bäst på miljö. Det var förfärligt så därför så satsade höger knallhårt på på miljö i lång tid i valkampen allt möjligt och så målte de igen och så fant ut att 2 % syns att höger var bäst på miljö. Du måste ha trovärdighet, ikke sant? och det är er någonting som det var så gott att höra på John from Roth från The Democrats Abroad jag sätter väldigt pris på det att han inte att han är er påhållande i att kommentera norsk politik. Jag syns att det är er, det är er, det er men de tingen han sa syns jag var det var var hjärtevarmande. och höger är er en svårt viktig del av detta. Och det tror jag att eh gör det omöjligt för 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 att bli ett rent konservativt parti. Eh, svarer det på spørsmålet på noen selvsmåte? 
Absolut, absolut. Och eh, det är er väldigt intressant att få nåt upp någon sån perspektiva utifrån och eh, och eh, för så följa upp lite. Tror du ekonomiska eller mer kulturella spärrsmål kommer att präga konservatisme framöver? Jag tänker både i Norge men också utanför våra gränser. Ja, det finns ju ingen ekonomisk konservativ i Norge i i år eller i 2020 brukte stor staten för 60 procent av landet samlade förbruk. Det är er det högste i Norges historia, men det er också det högste i Europa. Så det är er inte det är er också klassisk konservativ politik som jag tror att det är er något särskilt att hända där. Jag ville Jag vill bli väldigt jag vill bli högre väljer, vis högre blir ekonomisk ansvarig igen, men det tror jag inte kommer till chef. Det är er inte en kritik av högre, det är er bara en kritik av hur den världen är er, och hur den praktisk politik är. Er. Det är er väldigt svårt att vara fiskalt konservativ i Norge. När det gäller kulturkonservatism så tror jag att högre har en mission att spela. Jag tror att detta poäng som gick igen i alla talarna från CSU till Torierna till eh, republikanerna på trots av att detta uppenbart var tre högst olika konservativa stämmer eh, så gick det igen detta med hur mycket stämmer det var att i kulturen. Och jag syns att det poängen som eh, eh, Clark eh, Briten eh, lyftet fram detta med att arbetarklassen är er konservativ. Eh, och det är er, det har er som min erfaring i Norge att eh, att det den nedre tredjedel av befolkningen i ekonomisk förstånd är er svårt patriotiska. de är er väldigt glad i det det är er folka som 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 stämmer på Norge i Melodi Grand Prix som var svenska som var svenska vän spökte om. och höger har inte varit gode till att i vara ta detta. Och i min förutsvar så så säger jag att de som är er under press är er den konservativa flöjen i höger. Höger har haft alltid haft en konservativ flöj det som utmärker sig ved denna flöjen är er hvor otroligt impotent den är. Er. Efter åtta år med makten så har er det finns inte en klar konservativ seger som de har klart att få genomslag i regeringen. Norge är er ett land med ett svagt försvar, allt för stor stat, liksom ett Europas mest liberala invandringsregime. Alla dessa tingene kunde konservativa väljare fått fra arbetarpartiet. Og jeg tror at de konservative må, eh, i Høyre eh, har, 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 har to roller å spille. For det første så tror jeg at de må bli flinkere til å båndlegge de verste impulsene til de liberale eh, eller rosa segmentene i Høyre. Ikke alt som er internasjonalt er bedre enn det som er nasjonalt. Eh, det er helt grejt å være stolt av å, å, å være norsk. Eh, og liksom den den där biten den centraliserande new public management biten tror jag man kan med hell eh heller dämpa lite grann och samtidigt så tror jag att den typ av förslag som Torbjörn och Isaksen kommer med med, med ojevna mellanrum för för att testa vattnet så som de föreslår en national kanon jag tror att det att vara konstruktiva det att så komma med förslag och eh, se om om de finner gehör det tror jag är er det som de konservativa i höger måste göra samtidigt som att Jag vill väldigt advare mot eh och bringe någon eh och bringe någon stor ideologisk kamp in i ett parti i medgång. Det tror jag ville eh, ville vara någonting som historien inte ville tillge. Eh väldigt intressant att höra och jag vill inte gå ut av rollen som på något sätt programledare här och debattera så även om det var lite fristande det är er inte allt jag är enig och sånt men det är er också det som är er intressant att få ett sån blick utifrån på oss. Og, eh, men väldigt många intressanta perspektiv vi får här och hvis jag kunde också se si, alltså eller vet ikke om du är er enig med dig i enig med mig i er att det är er kanske mer populärt än på en lång stund att se si att man är er konservativ eller stack om konservativ politik och så kan man ju lägga för olika ting i vad det är er för nå men vi ser jo nu att att både Fremskrittspartiet och Centerpartiet också tror att bruka den märkelappen lite på sig själv för för att de tänker att det vill dra en viss typ av välgrupp och sånt och 
Jeg tror det er klokt av dem å, å konkurrere med, å, med Norges eldste konservative parti på å, å prøve å ta den merkelappen mer fra dem, eller altså, å utfordre på å... Altså, altså se dere bort fra hva konservatisme faktisk er, men det å, å kjempe om oss og fremstå som det. Ja, ja, absolut. För detta är er ju detta är er ju hittegods. Detta är er politisk hittegods. Det är er ju inte som om höger är er ett konservativt parti. Vad är er det som är er konservativt med höger? Man har ett par olika representanter som av och till säger någonting som eh vänsterpressen missliker, men längre längre går det inte. Centerpartiet har ju slått voldsom politisk mynt på att demonisera eh kontroversiell liberal eh, högerpolitik och då speciellt eh, regionsreformen, kommunreformen och politireformen. Eh, og det har de gjort ved och klä sig lite upp i nationale klær eh, og och vara folkliga. Eh, det är er ingen som tviler på att Centerpartiet kommer til att försvara Norges intresser. Eh, eh, og det är er, utan utan att bli trumpistiske så är er det helt uppenbart att at, at Centerpartiet är er ett er et norsk parti för norska väljare och vill försvara Norges intresser och de som bor här, ikke sant? Och det är er en trivlig leder alltid igen där. Eh, har en annan viktig del av det konservativa med arvegodse invandringsfrågorna. Ingen enkel sak har bidrat mer till konservatismens renässanse en liberal invandringspolitik. Detta är er en gave fra den fra liberalerna till de konservativa på grund av att så så många människor i eh, Europa är eh, er motiverade av invandringsfrågorna och det är er också motiverat så sagt att de stämmer i tråd med invandringsfrågorna. Det har i alla fall varit trenden i en rekke valg. Nu får vi se vad slags eh, vad som kommer att dominera efter pandemin, men i alla fall så har det varit en en styrkebrön för många partier. Och så är er det slik att olika partier har valt att hantera detta ulikt i Sverige och i Tyskland så har de liberala eh, bara ignorerat det och eh, och kört på med liberal invandringspolitik och har fått väldigt starka partier till höger för sig. Både AFD och och Sverigedemokraterna är er ju långt starkare i i väljartal och procent än det än det Främstepartiet er. I, I Norge så har så har Fremskrittspartiet nok gitt opp noe av sin troverdighet på dette feltet, eh, og gjennom regjeringsdeltagelse med, med Høyre. Nå, nå, nå ser det ut som at Sylvie Listau kommer til å bli den nye lederen i Fremskrittspartiet. Eh, det kan kanskje borge for et mer konservativt eh, Fremskrittsparti. Eh, og da sikter jeg til at uh, Sylvie Listau har ingen berøringsangst i forhold til kristendommen, i motsetning til Høyre. Uh, Sylvie Listau har ingen, <laughs> ingen, uh, 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 hvordan skal man si dette på en, på en hyggelig måte? Uh, hun har ingen reservasjoner uh, med å legge sig ut med, med populære og upopulære minoriteter uh, innenfor, alle, uh, innenfor alle segment, som jo også er noe som ofte varmer konservativ hjerte, la oss være ærlig. Uh, uh, og... Uh, s- Og i Fremskrittspartiet så, så har nok erfaringene med å styre landet gjort stortingsgruppen paradoxalt med nok mindre liberal og mer konservativ. Det er nok en, en annen grad av seriøsitet i Fremskrittspartiet efter å ha sittet i regjering med Høyre. Og det tror jeg at muliggjør det, det rareste av alle dyr, et konservativt centrum som utgjøres av tre partier, Høyre, FRP og Senterpartiet, naturligvis så er ikke dette et, et scenario for dette valget. Eh, da skal Høyre, nei, men da skal Arbeiderpartiet gjennomføre en valgkamp som er like sjokkerende dårlig som det de gjorde forrige gang, som naturligvis er tenkelig. Eh, det, jeg har gode venner høyt opp i Arbeiderpartiet som, er, som mener at partiet ikke klarer å komme sig gjennom på valgkampen uten borgerkrig. Eh, og da vil jo, eh, vil jo en Høyre-FRP-regjering være, være tenkelig, men jeg tror at på längre sikt så tror jeg at et stadig mer konservativt eh, Senterparti vil finne det stadig vanskeligere og mer unaturlig å være så alene eh, som, eh, som et stort tyngdepunkt i en regering der eh, et knapt flertall sannsynligvis eh, av de andre partiene har et, en annen mening 
Eh, og alle som har styrt med Arbeiderpartiet vet at Arbeiderpartiet ikke tar eh, så veldig hensyn til andre partier. Eh, og Senterpartiet kan da lett ende opp med å stå, å stå i denne veldig lite misunnelsesverdige situasjonen, der de har troverdighet, og de har lovet velgerne noen ting, og så klarer de ikke å levere noen ting som helst. Eh, og, der, eh, og det er en liten misunnelsesverdig posisjon. FRP eh, står der, og du ser hvor FRP har endt av det. Jeg tror ikke at velgerne er dumme. Det er ofte så blir politiske kommentatorer er veldig sånn, eh, enkelt, eh, er opptatt av enkelt variabler eh, som hva som motiverer velgere. Mitt syn er at eh, velgere, velgere er fornuftige, eh, og det, dette med troverdighet er viktig for velgere. Og det er noen ting der Høyre har akkurat nå en veldig god hånd når det gjelder troverdighet. Eh, FRP har en dårlig hånd når det gjelder troverdighet, men jeg tror at FRP kan komme til å eh, gjøre som Senterpartiet og ta seg en tur inn i Høyres bakhage for å hente konservative velgere. Det, eh, det ville jeg gjort <laughs> hvis jeg var i FRP. Veldig interessant. Eh, vi skal bevege oss litt ut i, ut i verden. Eh, vi, eh, vi var inne på at eh, Konservative partier har klart å slå kommunismen. Eh, nu er det nu er Kina eh, verdens største økonomi, eh, og de er, eh, de er autoritære, men har en markedsøkonomi som gjør at de, at de ikke er så lett å utkonkurrere som Sovjet, som, som da ikke hadde en markedsøkonomi og, og da ikke kunne, kunne vokse. Eh, og de har også en høy grad av, av, av innovasjon og, og teknologi. Um, og mange sier også at det her med produk produktivitet har blitt den nye geopolitikken. Det, å, det mest produktive landet vil uh, kunne ha det største forsvaret også. Mm. Um, I denne verden, uh, hvordan, hvordan mener du at konservative partier Uh, bør tenke om, uh, om, uh, om Kina, uh, både på det verdimessige, men også det sikkerhetspolitiske. Hvordan bør man, uh, hvordan bør man se Kina? Da tenker jeg ikke, ikke Norge egentlig, men altså alle de her uh, partiene vi har snakket om her, som, uh, som vi har hørt fra, men som var veldig diplomatiske, vil jeg si. Uh, mm. Men, uh, men uh, du som, uh, som både forsker på utrikspolitikk og Uh, kan si ting litt mer direkte. Uh, hvordan bør man møte et autoritært og, og voksende globalt uh, Kina? For å være helt ærlig så tror jeg at det kommer til å, til å, til å ordne seg selv. Uh, saken er at inntil relativt nylig så trodde vi, mange av oss, at Kina ville bli mer liberalt av å bli inkludert i en globalisert verden. Det vi ser er at Kina, eh, Kinas menneskerettighetsutfordringer synes om noe å bli mer graverende, eh, samtidig som at kinesisk diplomati eh, i stor grad krever, har underdanighet som mål. Det er ikke godt nok som britene ønsker å være en handelspartner. Eh, jeg tror britene lurer seg selv eh, når de tror at de kan være USAs allierte og nære venn geopolitisk, og samtidig ha et fullspektret handelsrelasjon til Kina uavhengig av hverandre. Australia prøvde dette, og Australia er jo nå fullstendig i fryseboksen, for det er ikke godt nok for Kina å, å si at vi er uenige om dette. La oss handle. Det, du må underkaste deg. Som Norge gjorde i forbindelse med Nobels fredspris Lu Chabot, der Norge forplikter seg til å ikke innta posisjoner som, som er kontrære med, med, med kinesiske interesser eller noen ting i den retning. Svært oppsiktsvekkende at, at Norge gikk inn på dette. Eh, og jeg tror at disse formuleringene er så oppsiktsvekkende at det er vanskelig å se for seg at det kan bli et status quo. Relasjon... Det, 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 det du sier egentlig det er jo at at, at, at en hold, at holdninger bør være å ikke ha handel med Kina? Altså. Nei. Eh, nei, jeg sier ikke. Eh, jeg, jeg, for Eller Norge. er det? Ja. For, nei, men, for, for, ja, men dette er viktig. Eh, saken er at eh, jeg har to ulike syn eh, i forhold til om jeg tenker globalt eller om jeg tenker nasjonalt. Mitt hjerte er, er norsk, eh, og jeg mener at det klokeste Norge kan gjøre 
är er att försöka och stå av ganska enkelt. Jeg jag tror att Norge ska försöka bevara gode relationer med både USA och Kina så länge som överhode möjligt. Den ekonomiska gevinsten i Kina är er så det er så stor gevinst att hente på att bli och vara plugget in i detta lokomotive att vi att det ville vara svårt oansvarigt och och välja det bort i alla fall utifrån ideologiska grunder. Det ville vara och det ville bryta med norsk utrikespolitisk tradition. Og jeg mener at vi bør søke å, å være i disse nyansene så lenge som overhovedet mulig. Jeg er høyst usikker på om Norge bør se en tenkelig mulig fremtidig konfrontation mellom USA og Kina som eh, slik vi så den kalde krigen. Eh, dette er noen ting som, avgjørelser som blir tatt i Washington D.C. og i Beijing, er... Eh, Jeg tror at vi skal forsøke å la oss trekke inn i dette eh, så langt som overhovedet mulig og holde oss til vår Atlant- vårt Atlantravsfokus. Atlantravspakten er vår forsvarspakt. Atlantravspakten er en geografisk avgrenset ting. Eh, vi kommer ikke til å gjøre i Afghanistan igen. Eh, og det tror jeg, jeg tror også at det, når, hva jeg nå sier reflekterer det reelle konsensus på, på Stortinget. Eh, men hva, hva vedrører det större bilden i förhåll till eh bör världen eh, plats för Kina så är er långt mer är er långt mer usikker. Och grunden till det är er den ikke, det är er Kinas uppträden i de, i det sista året som jag finner oroväckande eh, og och dessvärre lite överraskande för en autoritär stat. Den har hangen till om mobbe och plage små stater till att böja nacken och ge efter för också urimliga krav som jag sett i förhåll till eh, till eh, Filippinerna det och straffa land helt utan utanför alla proportioner eh, för att bara i varet sin sin suveränitet som Vietnam menar jag att det är er acceptabelt eh, jag menar vad vi ser eh, den kritiken som Australia eh, målbar i förhåll till til Kina och i förhåll till Hongkong-protesterna. Naturligtvis var det ett diplomatiskt felgrepp fra Australiens sida och ikke bygge en koalition och gå ut alene på den måten, men också motreaktionen fra Kina synes jeg er, er disproportional. Og hvis det är er den type global handelsorden som det, som Kina ønsker att bygga upp parallellt med den handelsorden som vi har byggt upp världens handelsorganisation så har jeg vanskelig for att se at, at disse kan sameksistere. For jeg trenger ikke fortelle dig eller någon andre at det å være konservativ er jo å være tilhengere i dag, er å være tilhengere av demokratiet, av markedsøkonomien, av menneskerettighetene, og viktigst av alt er rettsstaten. Og en, og en, og en mektig stat som tar sig friheter på dette, på dette punktet, det være sig Russland, Navalny-saken, eller det være sig Kina, i forhold til protesten i Hongkong og undertrykkingen av, av en legitim protestbevegelse, det gjør at vi blir svært urolige, og vi har vanskelig for att finna noen, noen fellesskap med disse. På den andre side så, 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 så hørte vi jo i dag eh, fra vår republikanske vän at det republikanske partiet har enda ikke kommet til klarhet i arven efter Trump. Eh, og, og la mig si det liksom eh, for de som ikke har fått det med sig, akkurat nu så er republikanernes plan å gå til valg med Donald Trump i spissen om fire år det finns ingen plan B og det vet Trump og det er også bakgrund for disse kommentarene at man er ikke villig til ta diskussionen en gang om eh, vad i all verden var det som skedde her hvordan kan vi hindre at dette sker igen? man er ikke i nærheten av det jeg synes at også Roth fra Democrats Abroad beskrev noen ting som er sant og i den situationen USA nå er så tror jeg at, at det vil være vanskelig for Norge eller noen andre NATO-allierte å slutte helhjertet opp om noen radikal politikk vis-à-vis Kina vår hovedlinje er fremdeles at vi håber, at Kina kommer til at blive mer demokratisk, kommer til at praktisere markedsøkonomi, at de kommer til at respektere menneskerettighederne, og at rettsstaten kommer til at fungere bedre. 
eh, men vi är er inte hoppfulla. Mm. Bara ett sista spörsmål, vi kan eh, hålla oss på det internationella och eh, gå lite norrover, norrområden och mm. eh, med och då tänker jag särskilt på geopolitiken där då. Um, vi, vi, altså det här med med Grönland är er ju fortsatt ett lite oavklarat frågeställ. Dan ska ha sagt att vi ska er klara betal för oss själva så måste gärna bli uavhängig. Det vill vara en, en enorm ändring för um, alltså i Norges bakår. Ehm um, och 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 samma visst Skottland skulle bli uavhängig och helt nya uh, avtal som ingås. Eh, og, og så er det selvfølgelig da eh, økende, mer offensiv aktivitet fra, eh, fra Russland og, eh, og, 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 og økt interesse fra Kina, eh, både på Svalbard og Arktis generelt. Eh, hvis jeg kan, kan spille, stille spørsmål sånn, altså, for det første, hva er Norges handlingsrom, og bruker vi det riktige? Eh, Norges handlingsrum är er långt mer inskränkt än det det bara var för tio år sedan. Eh, vi har eh, en långt mer utfordrande säkerhetssituation nu än det vi har haft. Försvaret vårt är er inne i en grundläggande eh, genuppbygging som kommer till att ta tid. Eh, og, eh, jeg, jeg, jeg kan vara med och kritisera vad valg som har blivit gjort, men detta är er fakta. Vi är er inne i en genuppbyggning, det kommer att ta tid och vi brukar stor pengar på det. Men i akkurat nu eh, så är er vi knappt i stand till att försvara oss selv. Eh, og därför så är er vi också mer avhängiga av våra allierade. Eh, og därför har vi nødt till att ta valg eh, som har medført att vi har fått eh, toppen stationerat eh, på en permanent basis och att vi ser mer flygaktivitet. Eh, alle alla dessa här är er vuxna valg. Eh, og vi er voksne, derfor forstår vi at det er nødvendig. Eh, det, eh, rikets sikkerhet er, er, er det viktigste som vi, ivaretar, som vi ivaretar, og regeringen har gjort det innenfor som er, det som er nødvendig og innenfor de rammene som er. Jeg er av den oppfatning. Jeg, 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 jeg er på linje med Bjørn Sterne Bjørnsson i, eh, I denne fantastiske verselinjen de, eh, hvor ære og vår makt har de hvite seid oss brakt. Vi skal aldrig glemme at Norge er en frihandelsnation. Vi ska fortsätta tjäna våra pengar på att vara bäst och sälja ting som är er svårt svårt dyre för det är er svårt svårt bra och vanskligt att köpa andra andra Det är er, det är er vårt enda konkurrensfortrinn. Men när det gäller vad vi gör geopolitik, så skrev vi en sak allerede då Börge Brende först blev utrikesminister om eh, låt mig visa dig mitt Afrika kart. Jag menar att norsk geopolitik må finna sted i närområdena. Og jeg mener at Norge bør være langt mer til stede i de gamle, gamle skattelandene. Eh, og her snakker vi eh, naturligvis eh, ikke om, 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 sva, eh, om Svalbard. Svalbard er norsk, eh, er norsk territorium, eh, og Svalbard-traktaten ligger fast. Men nå snakker jeg om Færøyene, Shetland, Skottland eh, og eh, Island, eh, og også på Grønland, så tror jeg tiden er moden for langt sterkere norsk nærvær. Vi är er en stor makt i våra i våra närområden. Detta är er, eh, I, I de norska havområdena är er det är er, eh, vi stora pengar. Eh, detta är er hvor vi har vårt fortrinn eh, när det gäller teknologi som oljesektorn har gett oss och vi är er en sjöfartsnation. Och jag menar att allt för länge har vi glömt eh, områder hvor vi faktiskt har troverdighet. För jag jag syns att er att höra att Rott säger att att Norge att Norge representerar en guldstandard inom för internationell diplomati. Det gör det det gör mig stolt. Eh, men världen har ändrat sig. Eh, det är er inte längre kostnad kostnadsfritt och och kasta sig in i en vär eh, situation eller politisk process eh, i ett annat land med utan annat eh, annat motiv än att göra gott. Eh, og jeg tror at norske interesser dikterer en utenrikspolitik, som er mer til stede i nærområdene. Eh, og da kanskje, man skulle, kanskje vi skulle lære litt annet av Senterpartiet. Dette her er gratis territorium. Det er ingen som bryr seg. Det er, det er ingen andre land. Eh, Shetland, Færø, Shetland er glemt område av Storbritannien. Færøyen er glemt område av Danmark. Island är er en liten stat som ser så upp till Norge och som aldrig blir blir tatt hänsyn till av storbror. Och Grönland är er trolig 
en ny nation som er i ferd med å bli født. Norge har lange og stolte tradisjoner på Grønland, eh, og jeg synes det ville være svært naturlig at Norge var et av de første landene som, som, eh, som eh, eh, utvidet sitt eh, fotavtrykk, sier man, jo, eh, lar sin makt bli følt eh, i, i disse områdene. Det tror jeg ville være svært klokt. Bra, gode konservative tanker på utenrikspolitikken der. Og, eh, så med det så sier jeg bare tusen takk for, for deg, eh, til deg, Oslo, og til alle som har eh, medvirket, og ikke minst eh, sekretariatet vi har hatt som har satt, satt opp det her eh, litt sånn krevende tekniske arrangementet. Og eh, det her var også organisert av Høyres internasjonale utvalg. Vi ble nedsatt bare, for, bare i fjor sommer og håper å ha flere sånne her debatter for å få frem internasjonale spørsmål og se, og se norsk politikk i en litt større ramme. Det ha det bra!